everybody loves a garden. There's something about all the growth and life around you that's really refreshing. It makes you think of spring and flowers and fresh garden salads. But the flip side of growth is just as important. That's decay, decomposition, rot. I know, no one wants to think about things rotting. In fact, we've built walls, both physical and cultural, to separate ourselves from this very natural process. We neatly bundle up our food scraps and throw them in the dumpster, out of sight, out of mind. We rake up the dead leaves in the fall, only to buy fertilizer and nutrients to keep our yards green in the spring. We go to a lot of trouble to pretend that our waste doesn't exist. But it does. And we're running out of space to hide it. Organic waste, that means stuff that was once alive, can take up to 20% of the space in our landfills. We don't have space to waste, particularly with a valuable resource full of nutrients that help enrich the soil. Have you ever been to a landfill? Really, everybody should visit one. It would give you a good idea of what people are talking about when they mention our solid waste problem. Landfills aren't just big holes in the ground where trash is disposed of. Landfills are specially designed so that they won't cause harmful effects to the environment. Design features include sophisticated liners to contain any contamination from the landfill, as well as sensitive detection instruments that are in place just in case the liner does leak. Landfills can't be put just anywhere either. The places where they are built must be carefully selected so there aren't any caves or sinkholes or water tables close to the surface. The bottom line is that landfills cost a lot of money to design, build, and maintain. But just because we have landfills to dispose of our trash doesn't mean we have to fill them up. In Missouri, we decided we need to reduce the amount of materials by weight going into our landfills by 40%. Now that may sound like a lot, but a lot of what was going into our landfills really didn't need to be there. It had a use. Now we're trying to reduce the volume of waste going in the landfills by taking things out that can be recycled before it gets put in the trash, such as paper, plastic, aluminum, and glass. Another way to recycle is called composting. Composting recycles the organic stuff from yard waste, which includes leaves, grass clippings, and unwanted vegetation from gardening. This is a compost pile. It's nothing fancy, just a big bunch of organic stuff layered on top of each other. A big garbage sandwich. But what it does is amazing. By mixing different types of material together, we can actually control and direct the natural processes of decay and decomposition. And the result is this good, rich stuff called humus. Put this on your garden and stand back. It helps the plants to grow and makes the soil softer and easier to work. Now composting is nothing new. The ancient Babylonians did it, and the Greeks and the Romans. Everybody practiced some sort of organic fertilizing. It wasn't until the early 1900s that a British agronomist working in India named Sir Albert Howard really started perfecting modern composting techniques. Ah, monsoon weather again, by the way. Hello, Bertie here. In India, we've got a bit of a problem. Soil, totally exhausted. Can't grow a bloody thing. However, we've worked out a method. We call it the indoor method. With this method, we're going to bring back life to the soil. It all started back in 1905. Upon arriving in the indoor region, I quickly surmised that we needed to improve the fertility of our soil. But how? Of course, societies back to the dawn of time were familiar with using manure to fertilize fields. But manure was scarce in indoor. The dried dung was used as fuel. It was too valuable to throw away on fields. So here's what we did. We gathered up what little manure we could find and we laid it out in layers. Guess what? We had humus. Then we stacked up some brush of the stuff we could air, laid it with manure and green plants. Guess what? Better humus and faster. This was working. Soon we were experimenting with spreading lime between the layers, stacking it into larger piles known as windrows, did this for 30 years and guess what? We got good at it. What we were doing was mixing different brown materials like dried down or dried leaves with green plant material. Now it's all worked out scientifically. The browns are carbon, the greens are nitrogen, and it's all part of the nutrient cycle. We didn't know that. Oh, no, didn't have a clue. 
we were just stacking the stuff up and trying different things, a little moisture here, more air there, and seeing what worked. But they all produced rich humus. Did this for 30 years. Ah, back of life. Ah, bloody hot. Let's take a look at what's going on inside of a compost pile. All right, the first rule of composting. Almost anything with organic origins, that is, anything that was ever alive, can be composted, provided that it hasn't been changed by great heat or pressure. The trick is getting the proper mix of materials to create a pile that will function chemically. It's what we call the nutrient cycle. Second rule of composting. People don't create compost. We just provide the materials. The real laborers in the heap are tiny microorganisms. These little critters eat and digest this organic refuse, and the result is humus. Now, in order to grow and prosper, these little microorganisms need four essential ingredients, an energy source, a protein source, moisture, and oxygen. What we humans do when we create a compost pile is provide these four things so the microbes can go to work. When Sir Albert was talking about browns and greens, he was talking about carbon and nitrogen. Brown organic materials such as sawdust, leaves, or dried plant stalks are rich in compounds which give microbes the energy they need. It's like candy to them, full of cellulose and sugar. Now when most people think of carbon, they think of yucky black stuff like charcoal. This is different. It's good to eat. Well, at least for microbes. Greens, such as grass clippings and food waste, provide the nitrogen. This provides protein, which allows the microbes to grow and reproduce. The proper mix of these two elements, carbon and nitrogen, or browns and greens, is the recipe to a successful compost pile. Of course, like all life on Earth, these little critters need moisture or water to live, so a compost pile needs to stay moist. They also need air or oxygen, so most composters turn or aerate their piles to keep them cooking. Now, all this chemistry may sound complicated, but remember, decay is a natural process. It goes on around us all the time. By mixing the browns and greens into a pile, we're just providing the microbes with the best conditions in which to work. Let's visit with Dr. Jim Carroll, a university professor who spends a lot of time looking at what's going on inside a compost pile. Hi, Dr. Carroll. Oh, hi, Alice. How are you? Just fine. What are you looking at? Oh, I'm looking at the critters in compost. Wow, what kind of critters are in there? Well, we're seeing on the monitor, which is coming through this microscope, all sorts of little protozoans that are feeding on a, probably a piece of compost here in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then there's some real small things that are moving around that are the bacteria. And they do the bulk of the work. They're the, the little organisms that do most of the breakdown. And there are literally hundreds of different species of bacteria there. So, Alice, here are a lot of the critters that we see in compost. And if you pick up a little piece of this, you can smell it. Mm -hmm. and it smells like dirt. It is. But the smell is made by the bacteria and the actinomycetes that are now considered bacteria and the fungi that all live in the soil. So you're, you're really smelling their waste products as they decompose the material. Then all these bigger animals are dependent largely on the action of all the little invisible bacteria and fungi. Sometimes you can even see the fungi though. There's, they form white masses like this. Mm -hmm. So can we look at one of these bigger critters under a microscope? Sure. What would you like to look at? Um, let's look at a sow bug. Okay. And you can see its antennae up mm -hmm. at the front with the mouth parts. And here is the tip of the abdomen. And these little white things underneath are its gills. So a lot of the animals that live in compost require a lot of moisture. The earthworms are, are very important too. Earthworms were studied by Charles Darwin and he, he worked on many things, but he wrote a whole book on earthworms. The worm feeds through the soil and usually goes into compost and then down into the soil. But when the compost is getting old and is becoming like the upper layers of the soil, then the worms will stay in there permanently. They're great creatures. They swallow compost and then pass it through the gut. 
and partially digest it and then make little pellets. They produce burrows and they aerate the compost. When the air gets down there, then it allows a lot of the bacteria and molds to grow and do their decomposition well. So they're pretty important. They're very important. Now, here's this slug that you wanted to see. Yeah. And so the slug will feed on the compost too as it's breaking down. It can feed on very fresh compost, things like green leaves, and break it down very effectively. One of the things I find amazing is when you dig through a compost pile, you'll find all these animals, as well as the bacteria and, and other things, all living together. And to me, it's remarkable that they coexist. No one understands how they manage to sort of divide up the territory. Let's take a look at the work these guys can do with the tour of Life in the Trenches. There are lots of other ways to compost besides your regular backyard variety. In fact, you don't even have to have it in a pile. Have you ever heard of a mulching lawnmower? It uh, was a fairly inexpensive lawnmower to begin with, and a little uh, mulching attachment, they call it, is actually a plastic block that blocks the discharge from the mower, and all the grass clippings and other yard waste stays under the mower deck, and it just stays under there and grinds it up. Obviously, something happens organically to break down the material. Uh, it goes away, so it must be composting. There are lots of ways we can reduce our volume of organic waste. That way it doesn't become a solid waste problem to begin with. But when you do have organic waste, like kitchen scraps, well then it's time to call in the worms. Worms are to help save our environment. We put in kitchen scraps and apple cores and stuff from our snacks that we have. We don't waste our foods and the worms get to eat and the landfills that are here on, in the United States don't pile up and we live in a healthier environment. Vermiculture with worms is composting on a small scale, but you really don't need to think small. In Lee Summit, Missouri, they're taking on a whole city's worth of organic waste with some pretty impressive technology. Yeah, this is the Lee Summit Resource Recovery Park. Uh, we own a landfill and a compost site. This is the yard waste facility. Uh, Lee Summit started this back in the fall of 1990 to uh, reduce the volume going into the landfill. This machine's a scarab. It's our compost turner. This machine straddles the windrow picks it up, aerates it, breaks down the particle size, and helps this uh, compost accelerate the breakdown. It's been a pretty good thing. The citizens of Lee Summit come deposit their uh, yard waste here, grass, leaves, and garden waste. Six months later, we turn it into a finished compost product that's reused on their gardens and their lawns at home. Now that's composting. Remember, anything that's organic and that was recently alive, like wood or plant material, can be composted. So when the holiday season rolls around, give a gift back to the earth and tree cycle. Tree cycling is a great idea because we're able to put back into the environment for wildlife habitat and for fisheries habitat materials that in the past were just thrown away. These Christmas trees that we are collecting either curbside or at our mulch sites are collected. And